necessary operatives, even if it were doubled, and, in a few years, the small advantage of the repeal of the Corn Laws would be balanced, a new crisis would follow, and we should be back at the point from which we started, while the first stimulus to manufacture would have increased population meanwhile. All this the proletarians understand very well, and have told the manufacturers to their faces, but, in spite of that, the manufacturers have in view solely the immediate advantage which the Corn Laws would bring them. They are too narrow-minded to see that, even for themselves, no permanent advantage can arise from this measure, because their competition with each other would soon force the profit of the individual back to its old level, and thus they continue to shriek to the working men, that it is purely for the sake of the starving millions, that the rich members of the Liberal Party pour hundreds and thousands of pounds into the Treasury. Of the Anti-Corn Law League, while everyone knows that they are only sending the butter after the cheese, that they calculate upon earning it all back in the first ten years after the repeal of the Corn Laws. But the workers are no longer to be misled by the bourgeoisie, especially since the insurrection of 1842. They demand of everyone who presents himself as interested in their welfare, that he should declare himself in favour of the People's Charter as proof of the sincerity of his professions, and in so doing, they protest against all outside help, for the Charter is a demand for the power to help themselves. Whoever declines so to declare himself they pronounce their enemy, and are perfectly right in so doing, whether he be a declared foe or a false friend besides, the Anti-Corn Law League has used the most despicable falsehoods and tricks, to win the support of the workers. It has tried to prove to them, that the money price of labour is in inverse proportion to the price of corn, that wages are high when grain is cheap, and vice versa, an assertion which it pretends to prove with the most ridiculous arguments, and one which is, in itself, more ridiculous than any other that has proceeded from the mouth of an economist. When this failed to help matters, the workers were promised bliss supreme in consequence of the increased demand in the labour market, indeed, men went so far as to carry through the streets two models of loaves of bread, on one of which, by far the larger, was written American eight penny loaf, wages four shillings per day, and upon the much smaller one English eight penny loaf, wages two shillings a day. But the workers have not allowed themselves to be misled. They know their lords and masters too well. But rightly to measure the hypocrisy of these promises, the practice of the bourgeoisie must be taken into account. We have seen in the course of our report how the bourgeoisie exploits the proletariat in every conceivable way for its own benefit. We have, however, hitherto seen only how the single bourgeois maltreats the proletariat upon his own account. Let us turn now to the manner in which the bourgeoisie as a party, as the power of the state, conducts itself towards the proletariat. Laws are necessary, only because there are persons in existence who own nothing, and although this is directly expressed in but few laws, as, for instance, those against vagabonds and tramps, in which the proletariat as such is outlawed, yet enmity to the proletariat, is so emphatically the basis of the law that the judges, and especially the justices of the peace, who are bourgeois themselves, and with whom the proletariat comes most in contact, find this meaning in the laws without further consideration. If a rich man is brought up, or rather summoned, to appear before the court, the judge regrets that he is obliged to impose so much trouble, treats the matter as favorably as possible, and, if he is forced to condemn the accused, does so with extreme regret, etc. etc., and the end of it all is a miserable fine, which the bourgeois throws upon the table with contempt and then departs. But if a poor devil gets into such a position as involves appearing before the justice of the peace, he has almost always spent the night in the station house with a crowd of his peers, he is regarded from the beginning as guilty, his defence is set aside with a contempt or so, we know the excuse, and a fine imposed which he cannot pay, and must work out with several months on the treadmill. And if nothing can be proved against him, he is sent to the treadmill, nonetheless, as a rogue and a vagabond. The partisanship of the justices of the peace, especially in the country, surpasses all description, and it is so much the order of the day, the tall cases which are not too utterly flagrant are quietly reported by the newspapers, without comment. Nor is anything else to be expected. For on the one hand, these dogberries do merely construe the law according to the intent of the farmers, and, on the other, they are themselves bourgeois, who see the foundation of all true order in the interests of their class and the conduct of the police corresponds to that of the justices of the peace. 
the bourgeois may do what he will, and the police remain ever polite, adhering strictly to the law, but the proletarian is roughly, brutally treated, his poverty both casts the suspicion of every sort of crime upon him, and cuts him off from legal redress against any caprice of the administrators of the law, for him, therefore, the protecting forms of the law do not exist, the police force their way into his house without further ceremony. Arrest and abuse him, and only when the Working Men's Association, such as the miners, engages a Roberts, does it become evident how little the protective side of the law exists for the working men, how frequently he has to bear all the burdens of the law without enjoying its benefits. Down to the present hour, the property-holding class in Parliament still struggles against the better feelings of those not yet fallen a prey to egotism, and seeks to subjugate the proletariat still further. One piece of common land after another is appropriated and placed under cultivation, a process by which the general cultivation is furthered, but the proletariat greatly injured. Where there were still commons, the poor could pasture an ass, a pig, or geese, the children and young people had a place where they could play and live out of doors, but this is gradually coming to an end. The earnings of the worker are less, and the young people, deprived of their playground, go to the beer shops. A mass of acts for enclosing and cultivating commons is passed at every session of Parliament. When the government determined during the session of 1844 to force the all monopolizing railways, to make travelling possible for the workers by means of charges proportionate to their means, a penny a mile, and proposed therefore to introduce such a third class train upon every railway daily, the Reverend Father in God, the Bishop of London, proposed that Sunday, the only day upon which working men, in work can travel, be exempted from this rule, and travelling thus be left open to the rich and shut off from the poor. This proposition was, however, too direct, too undisguised to pass through Parliament, and was dropped. I have no room, to enumerate the many concealed attacks of even one single session upon the proletariat. One from the session of 1844 must suffice. An obscure member of Parliament, a Mr. Miles, proposed a bill regulating the relation of master and servant which seemed comparatively unobjectionable. The government became interested in the bill, and it was referred to a committee. Meanwhile the strike among the miners in the north broke out, and Roberts made his triumphal passage through England with his acquitted working men. When the bill was reported by the committee, it was discovered that certain most despotic provisions had been interpolated in it, especially one conferring upon the employer the power to bring before any justice of the peace every working man who had contracted verbally, or in writing to do any work whatsoever, in case of refusal, to work or other misbehavior, and have him condemned to prison with hard labor for two months. Upon the oath of the employer or his agent or overlooker, I point e, upon the oath of the accuser. This bill aroused the working men to the utmost fury, the more so as the Ten Hours Bill was before Parliament at the same time, and had called forth a considerable agitation. Hundreds of meetings were held, hundreds of working men's petitions forwarded to London to Thomas Duncombe, the representative of the interests of the proletariat. This man was, except Ferrand, the representative of Young England, the only vigorous opponent of the bill, but when the other radicals saw that the people were declaring against it, one after the other crept forward and took his place by Duncombe's side, and as the liberal bourgeoisie had not the courage to defend the bill in the face of the excitement among the working men, it was ignominiously lost. Meanwhile the most open declaration of war of the bourgeoisie upon the proletariat is Malthus' law of population and the new poor law framed in accordance with it. We have already alluded several times to the theory of Malthus. We may sum up its final results in these few words, that the earth is perennially overpopulated, whence poverty, misery, distress, and immorality must prevail, that it is the lot, the eternal destiny of mankind to exist in two great numbers, and therefore in diverse classes, of which some are rich, educated, and moral, and others more or less poor, distressed, ignorant, and immoral. Hence it follows in practice, and Malthus himself drew this conclusion, that charities and poor rates are, properly speaking, nonsense, since they serve only to maintain, and stimulate the increase of, the surplus population whose competition crushes down wages for the employed, that the employment of the poor by the poor law guardians is equally unreasonable, since only a fixed quantity of the products of labor can be consumed. 
and for every unemployed labourer thus furnished employment, another hitherto employed, must be driven into enforced idleness, whence private undertakings suffer at cost of poor law industry, that, in other words, the whole problem is not how to support the surplus population, but how to restrain it as far as possible. Malthus declares in plain English, that the right to live, a right previously asserted in favour of every man in the world, is nonsense. He quotes, 